we will uh, continue with AI, but uh, more specifically with AI in healthcare. And um, when it comes to life sciences uh, in, in Sweden, we often, and policy questions, we often tend to uh, look at uh, the UK and uh, have them as a leading example. And uh, uh, knowing that the NHS is focusing, uh, is focusing a lot now on AI and uh, digitalization, I think it's uh, wise of us to uh, keep talking to our British friends uh, and listening to you. So I say warmly welcome to Indra Yoshi, who is Clinical Lead Digital Health and Artificial Intelligence National Health Service in England. Welcome. Hello, hello. So I'm going to up that and say it's not NHS England anymore, it's NHS X. So X-Men fan out there, how many? Hands up, hands up. Who's Marvel? Who's DC? Oh my God, come on guys, hands up. We've just had coffee. Who's watched Endgame? Avengers? Oh yes, one lady at the back and two. Great. Awesome. Okay, so it's not falling flat. Um, anyway, so hello everyone. I'm Indra. Um, I'm a doctor. I, I work in an A&E, so accident and emergency. So I like to be quite practical, I like to get my hands on things. If it's broken, fix it. If it's not broken, send them home, tell them not to come back again. No, obviously we care. We care about people. We're doctors. We love people. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I was so impressed by Magnus's talk earlier. I love the fact that he'd got a little bit of British humour, so you knew that he actually lived in England. So I apologise if my humour's a little bit too English, but, you know, you can always tease me afterwards about Brexit and I won't take offence. Um, so... What are we doing in the UK about AI? I mean, it's a massive subject, isn't it? And what does AI even mean? Well, we found out earlier. Uh, it means quite a lot of things to a lot of people. But um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the standards we're creating because we talked a lot about theory. We all love a bit of theory, don't we? But uh, what's practical? How do you actually put all that theory into something real and then put it into practice so someone like me can use it on the front line and make sure that a life is saved? kind of, because everybody dies, don't they? We've got to be honest with ourselves. We prolong death, we don't really save lives, but that doesn't make good political announcements, so we say save lives. Um, and uh, and then what we're doing to actually implement some of that, so how, how are we making some practical uses? And then I'm going to give you, um, Ingrid said, talk about examples. So I'm going to give you a few examples, but um, actually I'll tell you about some of the, the other stuff we're doing. So... Uh, I always think it's good to run through the NHS because people go, oh, you represent the NHS. And I'm like, well, the NHS isn't a thing. It's lots of things. And actually, as you can see, we have these things called commissioners. So in normal language, that means people who pay for things. So we, NHS, are commissioners. So we get money. And what do we do with that money is the basic question. Then you have people who provide services. Some of you are uh, services providers in the room, some of you are money holders, some of you are pharma and life sciences, so we have these providers and then we have people who make sure whatever is being provided is okay. But where does AI fall in all of that? Don't really know, doesn't really. And when you ask people they're a bit like, hmm, it's not really our problem is it? Because it's coming, it's coming. And when you say actually it's some of it's here, it's already happening, we've all got it on our phones and they're like, ah oh, yes, but not in health, it's still coming and you're like... Maybe not. Maybe it's actually here. So think about that, you know. Um, and why? Why give... Am I allowed to swear? Is that OK? Why give a shit about digital? I mean, how many of you in the room really care about digital services? Hands up. Good. OK, so we'll tone it down about digital a little bit. How many of you really care about life sciences? Oh, good. Good response. Good. Uh, gentleman in the back didn't really put your hand up, but that's fine. Maybe you don't really care about anything. Um, so we have a great Secretary of State, Matt Hancock. He's our Minister for Health and Social Care. Last year, he released this vision, vision of what technology can do. So the link is there. Um, if you want to go on the .gov.uk site, you can have a read of it. It's quite an interesting read. It's a little bit boring because it looks at technical things like interoperability, data standards, etc., which... Boring, but really important. Um, we then have our long-term plan. So the great government gave us 20 billion. That's a good lot of money. What do you do with that? 10-year vision. Make a 10-year vision, write it down on a document. It has to be true. So we have a 10-year plan. Uh, if you want to know what we in the UK are going to do, there it is. Um, chapter 5, 
five, I don't have five fingers, never mind. Five is uh, the digital transformation portfolio chapter. So if you want to know what we're going to do in digital, that's the chapter to read. Um, but most importantly, we don't really care about these documents. We care about the people. What do people want from all of this stuff? So a lot of what we do in the digital portfolio programme team is go out and talk to people and understand what their needs are. And so a lot of what we're doing is driven on actual user needs. And for those of you who are in digital will know that actually user-centred design is the way forward. So I told you I'd talk a little bit about practical things about standards. So we talked a lot about the theory of what AI is, etc. But actually, there's quite a lot of stuff out there, and we've got a lot of theory already that we're using. One of these things we've done recently is around what we call the digital assessment question for digital health technologies. Now, that could be anything. It could be an app, it could be a wearable, it could be a medical device, it could be a VR headset. I mean, you name it, it could be anything. Again, I've tried to put all these... We're a digital team, so we like to put things online. Um, so you can go and have a look at all of this stuff, all open source, all free. If you want to copy it, just say, <laughs> Indra, let you know. No, obviously, you can copy it and do what you want with it. We're, we're not bothered. Um, so do have a look. Developer.nhs is our website where we're putting all of our tools on there. And these set of questions, there's about 214 questions, and they cover nine different areas from cybersecurity, interoperability, um, data security, uh, evidence, standards, and there's some others. And also one that we don't always talk about, but accessibility. If you're doing digital, but actually you're not that accessible. And what I mean by accessibility is... Can somebody who is sight impaired read? If English isn't somebody's first language, what options are you giving them? So in the NHS, we have some really good accessibility standards, which we've tried to incorporate in here. And what we do is we assess these with subject matter experts against these set of questions. Obviously, it includes things like GDPR and the regulatory questions to say, have you met them? If you have, we then give people a kind of a, not a rubber stamp, but like a, a, a tick of approval. And they go onto our library. But also these questions are being used within our our commissioning people, the ones I showed you earlier, to say, you know, it doesn't matter what that thing is. If it's got a digital element to it, try and have a look at these standards and make sure they, they uh, match them. <coughs> Last year, we went out and actually, um, so a lot of you work in life sciences or like life sciences. Some of you didn't. Those of you didn't put your hands up. You like digital kind of. Um, the digital health, in digital health, everybody gets really like, oh my God, you know, do we have to do a randomised controlled trial to show that actually our product is good? No, you don't. Sometimes you don't. So we went out last year and we talked to a lot of people, talked to a lot of industry, talked to a lot of um, academia, talked to a lot of tech experts and said, what type of evidence generation do you need if you're producing a digital health technology? Um, the link is there. It's a wonderful tome. I think it's only 42 pages, this PDF. Um, but you can have a read of it. And basically, we categorised tools. So from the below is something really simple, like you just find a service. It's not difficult. You know, we, in England, we used to have this thing called the Yellow Pages. Now you have Google. They get a lot of money. Yellow Pages was free. Um, and then you have things that you guys in the room probably really care about. Uh, things that treat, things that do things that are exciting, and things that make me, as a doctor, a little bit worried. And actually, when we're talking about what we're calling now Tier 3B technologies, we have to start thinking about the level of evidence in a slightly different way versus these sort of system finders, service finders. So again, do have a look at it. There it is. Um, uh, and what we've done is... The two speakers earlier really defined that actually AI is learning. What we're not seeing a lot of really on the front line in deployment is real-time learning. So this standard covers the fact that if you are doing something, inverted commas, AI, um, it does cover that, but that AI is not real-time learning, and it is defined in there. So do have a look if you are interested, obviously. If not, don't. Go, on, go and read about Archie. He's quite cute, actually, for those of you who've seen his photos. Um, <laughs> so... So what are we now doing in AI in the UK? So last year, our minister um, said, I'd like you to write something. I'd like you to write a set of behaviours and principles. And I'd like to understand who's doing what in AI in the UK. 
Now, it's quite a broad question, like who's doing what? But we took the challenge on. We're not afraid, you know, we're going to leave the EU, apparently. Um, so, so we thought, we'll take on this challenge, we'll figure it out. So we sent out a national survey last year. We got 174 responses um, of people who said what they were doing in AI. The, the link is there, it's uh, AHSN AI Network. Um, and we wrote a report on it, because everybody likes writing a report, don't they? It's a good way to kind of showcase what you're doing. But actually, the what came out of it was people didn't have a clue. A, they didn't really know what AI was, so we tried to define it. Um, B, they didn't really know what they were developing. They were kind of saying, well, where's the data? If you give us the data, we can develop something, versus what's the problem? Therefore, let me develop something to solve the problem. And also then the commercial models, people are getting their knickers in a twist, and going, oh, I don't know, is that my IP, your IP? Can I commercialise it if I develop it in-house but never make it a commercial product? So all these people are going, oh, my goodness, so we wrote a report and we figured out what were the user needs out of that report. And we've done a whole bunch of work since then. The first thing I'm going to tell you about is we're doing another survey. So this is live on Twitter today. Yay. For those of you who are tweeters, tweeters, hands up. None. Okay, great. Yes, a few tweeters here. Brilliant. So if you do or if you are developing something and you want to complete our survey, there's the link. Have a look. Do tweet it. That's my that's my Twitter handle. And Jess Morley is my colleague. And NHSX is our new organization. Um, so what we're doing again is we're redoing the survey because we want to actually know where do we invest? Where do we focus? Where do we prioritize? So we're a national health service. We want to make sure that we give our taxpayers the best buck for their money. Um, there's no point in saying AI is going to solve all of health and care. Where is it? What's going to be deployable next year? What's going to be deployable three to five years time? Therefore, what do we need to prioritize in terms of our interoperability standards, our data standards, our commercial arrangements in that space? So that's why we're doing a survey. So do have a look if you want to fill it out. And this is about creating an ecosystem. So I talked a little bit about this on the back of, back of the, uh, the report we did last year. And we talked earlier about there are some basic needs, aren't there? How do you know if something's biased? How do you know whether the algorithm is actually doing what it said it did? Um, have you looked at the diversity of your data? And then some of the other things, like what's the impact if your algorithm is replacing a set of a workforce, what impact is that going to have? And how do you win hearts and minds in this place? But also, how do you win public? So for us, the NHS is it's a free at the point of care. It's not a free service, but it is free at the point of care. And people trust that brand. They trust those three white... Uh, they're blue, aren't they? Yeah, they're blue. Three white letters and a blue background. Um, so how do we maintain that public trust? Um, so last year and earlier this year, there's the link. We published a code of conduct. So the code is there as a set of behaviours. Um, Stefan talked about these behaviours in a sort of uh, very academic way. But what we've done is actually put them down and relayed them in a practical sense. So if you're thinking about GDPR, what does that mean? Have you done your data protection impact assessment? Who's your data controller? Who's your data processor? Put that on a piece of paper for us. If you're thinking about using open standards, have you shown that you've used open standards? Also, number seven, principle seven, was the most difficult one. And we went out and talked to a lot of people about this. But it's that algorithm. So show what that algorithm does. Don't have to tell me the line-by-line -line code. But we want to know what's going in, what's coming out, and why is what is coming out dependent on what's going in. So we published this code of conduct. And the idea is, is to increase that set of behaviours. So this isn't just about us as government. This is about you as regulators, you as tech developers, you as the community, you as think tanks. doesn't matter who you are. We have to work together in the system where everybody is accountable for some form of that system together, which is why we're calling it an ecosystem versus this sort of top-down heavy approach. We are saying that you've got to do good. That's the main aim of health, right? Do good don't do harm. Simple. If you keep those things in your head as you're developing something, hopefully nobody dies. But as we said, people die, so got to be pragmatic. So this is the ecosystem we're developing. Um, so I've talked about the list of solutions. This has got a busy slide, and that's because it's really hard to say all of what we're doing 
in one 20 minute talk. <laughs> um, this has been 18 months of work of my life. But what we're doing is we've been, we're, we're finding out. So let's go fact finding, find out who's got what, where, where's the data coming from, and what is the thing they are solving. The second is then practically, how do you show that you've actually done all of this in a good, generous, sensible way? So we're creating a workbook on the back of that code of conduct I spoke about. The third thing we've done, and we've just finalised the document, so do look out for it, is go a little bit more into depth on the algorithm. People get, their, people get really worried about algorithmic workings. So saying, well, let's just take it out a bit and create almost like a data ethics workbook to say, what the thing you've developed, is it okay? Is it ethical? So that's what we're talking about in the blue box. And then... Um, and then it's great. So it's great to do all the technical detail. But what about the people? You know, what's the problem you're solving for them? And obviously, I mean, I was telling somebody earlier, you know, we've got a workforce of 1.2 million. If we're saying, oh, yeah, AI is going to come and solve all of our problems and hopefully we can get rid of half of you. I mean, that's not a good line, OK? So we've got to understand what do we need? What do the workforce want us to focus on as a system. So we're going out, we're doing a piece of work with a couple of think tanks to say, can you tell us your user needs? So again, we're trying to do this as a two-way approach. We're then, we're then something very similar was with, uh, with primary care. So it's not just about clinicians and clinical people and physicians, but also if you're a receptionist, what would you really like? You know, what's the good thing that we can deploy over the next six months that's really going to help you in your work? And then the most important thing that we've really got to do on all of this is change how we regulate it. So we've got some really good regulation. Regulation works quite well. But we've got to start understanding how we regulate in real time. So we're not just regulating here, and then as something develops, we regulate it here. But it becomes a pathway, and it becomes a real-time pathway, and there is a feedback mechanism. And we understand that cutoff point when the thing that you develop today here is fundamentally different because, obviously, that line... And I'm no technical expert, so I don't really know what that line is, but I know there is a man who is who is very clever about this line. I met him at a conference and he spent a long time of his life looking at this line. But there is a line when something fundamentally changes, so when your algorithm fundamentally changes. And at that point, we need to find a way of how do we, A, identify that line in real time and then make sure that the thing that comes after the line is, uh, is regulated. So all of this stuff we're doing is to work towards helping us change our regulatory service because actually... Great, well done for doing all these pieces of document, doing all these case studies. But if you can't regulate it, then nothing can ever go live. So not much use. And, and, the, and the list on the side is all the partners we're currently working with. OGD stands for other, other government departments. UPD stands for Understanding Patient Data. So this is a branch of the Wellcome Trust, who are a big think tank. Um, the RSA is the Royal Society of Arts, because even though we're like medical, we like to talk with the artists. Um, AMRC is the Academy of Medical Research Charities, and AOMRC is the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. There we go. Got it right. Brilliant. Um, so, so those are some of our partners. And AHSN, for those of you who don't know, are your academic health and science networks. And AI, everybody in this room now knows what that means. Um, so it's great. So well done. We're doing all of this stuff. Where do you find it? So what we're doing is it's all in progress. So we've kind of put this as our one to two year plan. We're probably about five months into our one to two year plan. So all I would say is watch this space. We're going to put a lot of this on GitHub. So for those of you who are familiar, it's a platform where you can put your source code and lots of other wonderful things. And for those who aren't that familiar with GitHub, we'll put it on our website, nice and simple, nhsx.nhs.uk. Um, and this is what we're trying to do. So you share, inform, you help, you connect, you create. It's an ecosystem. We've got to work together. We've got to do it all together. So I'm going to take a little pause there so you can have a look. Um, yes, now some examples because, you know, well done, lots of theory, but what are you actually doing? So here are a couple of things that we're doing. We'll find out a bit more in more deep depth with these cases because we're going out and doing deep dives with some of them. But this is a great example. I do like this one. So it's a company called Cortical who have partnered up with... Um, 
So we have a national unit called NHS Blood Transport, who basically transport blood around the country. So if you need O negative here or you need platelets here, their job is to know where that blood needs to go. Um, and they also need to know when to get that blood there. Because obviously certain types of blood products have have short half-lives. So they are partnered together. You can see, um, so all they're doing, they're trying to A, reduce who's asking for what when they don't need to be asking for that. So if I'm just making it up and going, mm, I don't know, maybe today I need seven bags when actually I only ever needed three, they're using a set of models to understand on the data they have what model will best predict where the blood needs to flow. So that's one. Another one is with the British Heart Foundation. So they're one of our big charities looking at cardiovascular disease. They've partnered up with a centre up in the north, or maybe it's the Midlands, the middle of the country, to look at uh, CTs and detecting uh, myocardial infarction. This one's just images. <laughs> so I went to this conference last week and I asked the guys, I said, oh, can you send me some stuff? So they sent me their the quote of their paper so for those academics in the room do have a look at the paper the, <laughs> these are images of a fetal heart and fetal bodies the idea is to run real-time algorithmic algorithms no that doesn't make sense real-time algorithms on these images to understand a how big they are what the feet what what um the fetal organ sizes are and therefore because apparently i'm no radiologist but apparently measuring all of this stuff in real time whilst the baby's moving is a bit of a nightmare so they kind of they capture it they understand oh that's the heart this is how big it is so they're doing that so these guys are looking at uh what you write in an, in an EHR, in a, in a health record. So quite often it's quite messy data, it's quite dirty. But if you actually start capturing key things within that data, so something might be flu. So flu-like symptoms, we all write that. What does it really mean? Well, it means you might have a runny cold, a fever, muscle ache, etc. And then deciphering that and going, well, we've seen in this type of set of records lots of flu-like symptoms. Can we use that type of information? to then predict where those people are going, but also when our next flu-like symptom um, uh, batch of folk might come along. And that's it. But this isn't the end of what we're doing. So we've got a huge amount of investment from what we call the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. So our life sciences sector, along with industry, have invested a huge amount of money into lots of different things. Some of them are centres of data excellence. You'll have heard about them, maybe. We've got something called HDR UK, Health Data Research UK, where they are building what we're calling digital innovation hubs, DIHs. As you can see my job is understanding acronyms that's all it is if you can understand an acronym you can definitely have my job uh, so I have lots of them in my head and fear not what I'm trying to do because I think it's a little bit ridiculous this is create a front page with pictures that you can click on to understand this landscape therefore it makes it a bit simpler to talk about versus all these silly acronyms um, so yeah so do have a look out from a life sciences perspective HDR UK are creating what we're calling innovation hubs of data so they'll each have a separate region I think there are five five or four of them around the country which are looking at a particular things so it might be cardiovascular disease it might be diabetes it might be something like that and then you can go and you can have access to that data it's a safe haven and you can do research on it and at the same time they're doing something in imaging so they're creating these centers of of excellence in AI imaging. Again, I think there are either four or five of them dotted around the country. Same principle. How do we get out those images, create a, a safe haven for you to do something on them? What my job and the job of the team that I work with is, is how do we then safely implement those once they've been deciphered? And there's so much more, but I'm going to stop there because, you know, it gets a bit tiring talking, doesn't it? And I'm sure you've got questions. Great. Great. Thank you. Great. <laughs> What's your, the driving force behind all this work? It's a bit of there's a need. So we do user research. There's a need to do it. You know, people keep saying, oh, it's coming in two years' time, or we're not sure about it. So there is a need. Uh, there's a political drive. So... Our Prime Minister, Theresa May, last year, she announced what we call four AI missions. Two are sort of in health. So one is an AI mission in early diagnosis, and the other one is in ageing. Uh, and then there's one in sort of energy and one in smart cities. So from a top down, there's been a focus as well. And, and why is that? Oh, I don't know what goes on in her head. No. no. <laughs> Who knows? To bed. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> no, but but seriously, is 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 it to, uh, is it to get a strong AI industry? Is it to manage the demographic? Yeah. I mean, the line uh, is, is to say, you know, we want to make the UK a leading place to develop and deploy these technologies. Mm. So that's the line. Okay. And I will welcome our next speaker, who is Henrik Grönberg. Uh, who I know is here. There you are. Uh, that will um, give us some more flavor of what is actually going on in uh, oncology research and AI. And you will definitely give us some uh, examples, I know. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's quite fascinating to stand here uh, talking about AI. Um, as a medical doctor, as an oncologist, I'm a, uh, I've been working with cancer patients or treating cancer patients for 30 years and at the same time doing research. And um, I'm going to give you two examples. Um, one on a more complex uh, algorithm that can aid uh, prostate cancer diagnostics and another AI uh, product that we have. Uh, I'm working half-time as uh, a professor at Kalinska Institute um, and half-time as the head of the Prostate Cancer uh, Center at St. Jonas Hospital in Stockholm. For you who don't work with prostate cancer every day, this is usually the first slide I show. Um, it's common and it's increasing. Uh, this is something that's uh, uh, in 2012, there were 1.1 million uh, people that were, or men that were diagnosed with prostate cancer worldwide. And in, in about six years, there is 1.6 million. Uh, and um, the, you can see the mortality. And one of the interesting things here is that um, you see the dark blue areas. Those, this is where prostate cancer is more common. And then you have the lighter areas is where uh, prostate cancer is uncommon. And you can see that in Europe and in Americas and in Southern Africa, prostate cancer is common. And in Asia, it's uncommon. And when I started my PhD 25, 30 years ago, uh, this is one of the questions. I tried to understand the etiology of prostate cancer. Why, why were they, uh, these differences? And to be honest with you, today we don't know anything more than that. So that's a question we haven't understood. Um, there's been a lot of discussion is red meat or tomatoes or physical um, exercise. But one thing I could say, the, say to you, alcohol has nothing to do with smoking, has nothing to do with... Uh, so it's something else. But it's common. This is the Swedish numbers. In Sweden, 2,500 men die of prostate cancer. So it's, not a, uh, it's actually the most common cancer death uh, in Sweden today. And the other number that I think is quite fascinating is that 110,000 men are living with a prostate cancer diagnosis today. So it actually is quite a lot of men. Um, and it actually, the, the healthcare, the direct healthcare cost is most likely about 1 billion euros, 10 mil, uh, billion Swedish crowns uh, today. And it's uh, increasing quite rapidly because of the new drugs, really good drugs that we get for prostate cancer. This is the problem. You have 100 men. The problem with prostate cancer, there's no symptoms. There's no way to detect prostate cancer with any symptoms or signs before it's too late. Uh, when it's too late, you get spread in the bone, you get symptoms. But before that, there's actually no symptoms. Uh, compared to breast cancer, we have a lump in your breast, or colon cancer, we have bleeding. Uh, prostate cancer has no symptoms, and that's very important. So if we're going to detect this early and actually treat it early and to decrease mortality, we need to diagnose this uh, with some kind of diagnostic tools. Um, and you can see it's quite common. The little bit more red men are those men with prostate cancer that needs treatment. But the other problem here is that you can see there's a lot of, of pink men. Pink men is uncommon, but you can see that pink men um, is really men with prostate cancer that don't need treatment. So this is a problem. It's not only that you have prostate cancer in common, but you also have a lot of men with prostate cancer that you don't need to find and treat. So this is the, I'm going to talk about the diagnostic pathway of, of prostate cancer. You have a blood sample, you take a tissue sample from the prostate, and then you do pathology evaluation. And based on all that, you do treatment decision. I'm going to take you to the, the blood sample and the pathology evaluation in about two large projects that we've been uh, uh, running in my research group the last 10 years. The first one, the blood sample. You 
heard about sensitivity and specificity. And I, I really like the first speaker. He was also at the, uh, an epidemiology department, and so am I. So I think for a test to be employed uh, more broadly, it has, to have fairly, it has to have good sensitivity and specificity. And we use PSA. PSA has been used for 30 years. It's prostate-specific antigen. It's a very simple blood test that costs almost nothing. It costs 50 to 100 Swedish crowns. But the problem with the PSA test is that it's actually low sensitivity. It actually only finds about two-thirds, about 65% of the, uh, of the aggressive prostate cancer. But even worse, it's actually the, the, spe- the specificity. Four out of five men with an increased PSA don't have prostate cancer that needs treatment. So we need to improve this. And this was a, a, a problem that uh, our group was facing, not only our group, but thinking, how are we going to tackle this? Uh, and one of the key things was that, that we, we cannot only use one biomarker. We need to use multiple things. And this is where the new technology uh, comes in with uh, genomics, proteomics. And the driving force of this was actually putting a test together where you use protein biomarkers, genetic marker, and clinical data into one algorithm. So this is not AI. This is just putting uh, different biomarkers and clinical data together in one algorithm that actually tells you much better than PSA what is your risk of having aggressive prostate cancer today. So in this, uh, we developed the Stockholm 3 test. It's five uh, plasma biomarkers. It's about 100 genetic markers that carries information about the genetic susceptibility of prostate cancer together with clinical data. These are things, at least the, the total and free PSA that's used in the clinic today. A lot of the clinical data here is also available. The problem is, I, did a, I had a talk I think it was five years ago, to what we call the cutting edge of prostate cancer in the Nordic countries. It was 50 specialists in prostate cancer. And I posed two uh, different cases to them uh, with two different PSA levels and ages. And if the PSA had gone up or down the last a, a year and I asked them, what do you do? And with these kind of very, very simple uh, uh, input data, two thirds of the audience got it wrong. Th- something that they actually have been using and uh, for every day for about 20 years. So for it's difficult for a doctor to, I mean, interpret one data, but if you take two or three data that are dependent on each other, then it's actually too difficult problem to make a good decision. So this actually algorithm will take care of that in a much more stringent way. And I'll show you the... What we did then, and I think this is a quite unique example, what I did then was actually in 2011, I went to the Stop- uh, Stockholm County Council and said that we have a problem in Stockholm with prostate cancer testing. Uh, and they said, we agree. So they actually funded the whole Stockholm 3 study uh, through public money. So then what we did then was inviting, uh, we, it was 58,000 uh, men in the Stockholm area, age 50 to 70, that gave a blood test. And 7,400 of them were actually biopsied uh, uh, in the study. So it was a huge study to be able to actually first train the algorithm and then to validate the algorithm in the same study. And I'm really happy that we did a large study because then the algorithm is, is much more stable than if you'd done a smaller study from the beginning. So the result was actually much more, uh, was actually much better than we thought from the beginning. We can reduce the number of unnecessary biopsies. And why should you reduce uh, unnecessary biopsies? Well, as any, anybody who's done a prostate biopsy or uh, undergone that understands why I say that. Uh, because it, what you do is you take a rectal probe, that's this long, this thick, uh, stick it in your rectum, and then you d- do 12 shots uh, into the prostate uh, with some kind of um, anesthesia, uh, but it, it's quite painful um, and it's not that fun. Um, but you also, about 5% of, of, uh, of the men after biopsy get uh, really serious infections and can get really, really sick afterwards. So there is definitely a need for reduction of unnecessary biopsies, and we can actually take away half of those. We could also increase 
the number of aggressive uh, prostate cancer will be fine with about 20%. Uh, but also find the aggressive cancer in the low PSA range 1 to 3, where we never have looked before. And that was the thing that one of my, a lot of my colleagues said, that we've never seen prostate cancer with a 2.1 PSA before. Well, there they are, but you never looked before. So we published this, and um, this is now, this was published in 2015, developed to clinical test, and in 2016, um, since then it's been actually clinical tests been used by about 15,000 men so far in Sweden and Norway. Um, and I'm just going to show you some data from Norway, Stavanger, the, the uh, Hälse West uh, healthcare region. Um, this is quite fascinating. I was contacted in 2016 by a GP doctor in Stavanger, Sven Chusavik. But this guy is quite fascinating. He's a GP, uh, and he said that, I heard that you've done a new prostate cancer test. I want to introduce it in Stavanger. And this guy said to his colleagues, um, he first convicted the hospital. There's only one hospital in Stavanger that do prostate cancer diagnostics. He convinced them that don't take patients that don't, haven't done the Stockholm 3 test. Then he convinced 100 primary care units to just switch from PSA to Stockholm 3 overnight. So the 1st of September 2017, the whole healthcare region just switched from one day to another. Really quite fascinating. And then, of course, now we have data, and this is just the first data that uh, we got from him. They have best practice. They do MRI uh, scans before they do biopsies and everything. But, but just uh, changing the blood test from one test to another, what happened is that uh, the number of Gleason 7, which is the bad ones that you want to find, increases from 100 to 187 uh, during the six-month period. But also the, the uh, not bad ones that you don't want to find decreased. Um, so this is just by, in one healthcare uh, region, just switch from blood, one blood test to another. And the interesting thing, of course, health economics is very important when you introduce new things. This is a report he did for the uh, Norwegian, um, uh, 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 um, what do you call, government on this issue. And the bottom line here that just in the primary diagnostic setting, they will actually save 36% of the cost just by doing another blood test. And the blood test costs 20 times more than PSA, but it actually saves uh, down the line quite rapidly. This was the first example. Then we go to, now we're going to AI. And in two and a half years ago, I've never been into anything that was called AI. Um, but I remember about almost two and a half years ago, two of my PhD students came and said, you know that Google has released their uh, picture recognition algorithm for everyone to use. And then they say, how can we use that? And I said, well, we have digitalized all the biopsies from the Stockholm 3 study, which was about 80,000 biopsies. I, I did that two years early, not knowing what to do with them. And I had a feeling that it might be of some use sometime. Um, and after these, now we're standing here, we actually solved the problem, how to find uh, prostate cancer in prostate biopsy by a computer. So what's the problem? Well, the problem in what we call intra, high intra and inter variability. If you talk to prostate pathologists, uh, the problem is that if you show the same slide to two pathologists, uh, in two thirds of the cases, they don't agree on the grading. Um, and if you, say, if, if you uh, show the same slide to the same pathologist uh, later in the week, between 5 and 10% of the time, he or she will do another evaluation of the grading. So it's not good. And it was really, it was really nice. I, I uh, uh, met an uh, Italian pa uh, the pathologist saying that, OK, on a Friday afternoon, when I want to go fishing, I'm a pretty bad pathologist. I'm a much better one on Monday. So, so these are the things that everybody knows, but this is the way it is. Uh, so how can we solve this? This guy, Dr. Donald F. Gleason, he's been, uh, I mean, he did something uh, in the 1960s. He, he invented a grading for prostate cancer. And he died a couple of years ago, but his uh, grading system has been 
uh, the same for 50 years now. So nothing has changed for 50 years when it comes to prostate pathology. Uh, but he did do a very good job because, it, I mean, Gleason grading, as we call it, uh, is a very good prognostic factor. And to understand the problem, why this is important, the grading of the prostate cancer, is that we have a, a, a scale of five. One is a very latent prostate cancer that you don't need to treat. Two and three, you treat either with surgery or radiotherapy. Four and five are the really aggressive, fast-growing ones. You treat with hormones and radiotherapy. And of course, if you go from one to two, that makes a big difference, treatment or no treatment. If you go from three to four, it's also a big difference. You go from only treating uh, locally to hormonal treatment, which is a lot of more side effects. So the, the grading of the, the, uh, the tumor is extremely important for the treatment decision. And of course, we need to do better than the fishing uh, Italian pathologist on Fridays. So it's, it's really, we do, we, everybody recognizes this, but nobody's really been able to tackle the problem before. This is a prostate biopsy. This, the dark dashes here is actually where the prostate cancer is. But what we did, we actually digitalized all these uh, images uh, or all these slides from the Stockholm 3 study. And this, here comes to technical, and, and you are in the AI field, you can probably understand, but I just want to show you what these two brilliant PhD students and one uh, uh, Finnish uh, engineer did, have been doing the last three years. What they did were taking these images. First, they, they what they call tissue segmentation. They actually see where is the biopsies and where are the dark uh, dots. I said, Here, here's the cancer. And then they divided all these biopsies into small patches, small, small, small uh, pieces of the, um, the biopsy uh, image. And then you do benign uh, patches with no cancer, and you have small, small patches with cancer. And then you put this into an algorithm. And this is, of course, uh, something that is completely open. I mean, we use the uh, Google uh, neural networks. Uh, we take all the uh, extracted patches and actually said, uh, predicted if there is a benign Gleason 3, Gleason 4 or Gleason 5 grade uh, in these individual small, small pieces. And then you put that all together, uh, very uh, complex mathematical, uh, into a digital, uh, what do you call it, a biopsy. And then you can predict through what you call a boosted tree classifiers. I've, to be honest, really no idea what it is. But it doesn't really matter because hopefully you do in the back and uh, my colleagues know what they're doing. But from that, uh, you can actually detect cancer. You can, de you can estimate the cancer length in each biopsy. And you can also do estimation of the cancer grade. And when we started this, we, have actually, we had no idea how this would have, how this work. I mean, would it work or not? We didn't know. Uh, but of course, these three young talented uh, Research had put a lot of their energy and, and uh, time into this. Um, and what this is the final result of one biopsy, and just to show it as an example. The gray area, there's no cancer. The yellow area is a Gleason 3, which is the, the really uh, slow growing. And in the red areas, uh, there are Gleason 4 and 5. And this is just a, 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 an image of the biopsy. Um, so for each of these biopsies that we used in the algorithm for first training and then validation, these are the, the images that we uh, get from the algorithm. So how did it work? I said from the beginning that we actually almost solved the problem. I think we have actually. So this is a quite unusual. If you are into research and look into AUC curves, this is the, the curve that says if you have cancer or no cancer. And we have... Between that, uh, saying if it's a cancer or not, we have an AOC of 0.997 for each core and for 0.999, which is for each man that was included. Um, and that means almost perfect that we can say if this man has cancer or not uh, in a biopsy. Uh, and um, we could, the conclusion of this is that we can actually remove 90% of all the benign biopsies without missing any cancer. Uh, which is quite, I think, fascinating results. Uh, we never expected the, that the computer will be so good of actually uh, detecting cancer in the biopsy. 
Um, the next thing we did, we're just looking for cancer length and the correlation with the uh, uh, leading pathologists who have been looking at all this was almost perfect, 0.98. It tells you that, uh, I mean, if the pathologist says here's 3.5 millimeters of cancer, uh, it's most likely that the uh, computer says 3.5 millimeters. But that's okay, but then come to the difficult problem. What about Gleason grading? Which is absolutely the, the most vital thing for a treatment decision. Um, and this is the, the uh, slide that's supposed to uh, uh, explain that. This is what we did. We took 87 uh, cases with prostate cancer from the Stockholm 3 study. Lars Egenvard, who's been the lead pathologist in this, who actually been looking at all the 80,000 uh, biopsies, uh, just by, that's a hero by itself. Um, what he did was actually reaching out to 23 of the world leading pathologists, and Lars Egenvard was the president of the International Society of Europe Pathology. So, I mean, he's a world leading pathologist. And he said to 23%, uh, 23 of his colleagues that these 23 is actually making up what is Gleason grading. They are the international standard of Gleason grading. They said, okay, can you take a look at these and actually say uh, what Gleason grade uh, are in each of these? Uh, here we got 87 selected cases. And then we lit what we call the OncoWatch image, our AI tool, to do exactly the same thing. And then we said to each other, okay, and then we did what we call it Cohen's Kappa pairwise uh, comparison. And this is actually saying that you compare each of the pathologies to all of, other, uh, 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 all of the other pathologies and see how well they actually do uh, compare to each other. And those with the highest value are the best pathologists. And then we rank them. And, and it's really good for us that the guy that made the initial uh, Gleason uh, grading for us was actually, oh, sorry. Well, actually, the guy that was ranked number one. So that's good for him. Uh, but then we said, okay, how is the AI tool uh, doing in these 23 world-leading experts? Um, and we said, everything but the last place is fantastic. And as you can see uh, here, uh, three and seven of the pathologies are actually performing worse than we do. And we say equally good. Uh, but it's say we are actually on par with world-leading pathologies doing Gleason grading by doing this uh, algorithm. And the most fascinating thing is that when we sent this data to these 23 world-leading pathologies, say, please, uh, please take a look at the manuscript. We didn't know what to expect. <laughs> what kind of... Okay, you t here we send it to, to pathologists who, who have been devoting their life, 30, 40 years of their lives, of being expert of prostate path uh, pathology. And they are challenged by three young PhD students who've never seen a prostate biopsy before. What were their reaction? And it was quite fascinating. They said, this is fantastic. Uh, if we're not part of this, someone else will do it for us. So it was a very, very, uh, I think, thoughtful uh, and how could we be part of this development? Because we know that this is coming. So uh, it's quite fascinating. We've been writing up, uh, uh, writing uh, uh, up this uh, uh, in a manuscript now, and it's under review in um, uh, a New England Journal of Medicine right now. So hopefully we get a reply fairly soon. But I think that this, this could actually revolutionize the how you look at prostate pathology. And this is just a summary of the, the, uh, these things. Uh, and during this process, of course, we've been thinking about, okay, we've done this now very nice uh, scientific uh, experiment, if you call this. What's the next steps? And then we got to get into all these kind of different uh, issues that we heard uh, from uh, early speakers. Um, so I would just say that, okay, What's barriers for implementation for this? We've been thinking about this. The first of the thing I think is a very important question and I think it's been touched by others. First, AI tools need to solve an important problem. And it was really, I was a little bit scaring to see one of the former speaking saying by the high stakes, I mean, cancer diagnosis just came after uh, automated guns and, and machines. So I, mean, I can feel the pressure in some way, but that, that tells you that we shouldn't do it. No, I don't think, but you should do it very carefully and wise. Um, 
It was it wasn't interesting. We were invited to one of the the European leading uh, diagnostic uh, companies, Unilab, uh, in uh, to actually present this data together with three other companies that had done similar. The problem is that the other three companies didn't solve a medical problem, uh, but we did. So I think that's that's why hopefully they will choose our system uh, later on. But I think this is a thing that we should solve important problems. I think that's important. There's a healthy skepticism of new technology, and particularly in healthcare. I mean, my colleagues, they've been using PSA, for example, for 30 years. They don't want to use anything else. I mean, they are, they are safe with that. Uh, but I think the, it's not going to be perhaps my colleagues that's going to change this. It's going to be the patients that actually will require this when they understand what we can do. Trust. We, need, we tend to trust humans more than machines. I think that's healthy in a way. And as the same uh, fishing uh, Italian pathologist said that, I know that I make mistakes about five to ten times, uh, or five to ten uh, percent of the times. But that's okay because everybody knows that. But if a machine does a uh, mistake one out of 500 times, one out of 100 times, that's not okay. So there's different levels of, of what you... What do you expect from a human and what do you expect from a machine? Lack of legal framework for responsibility. I think this is very important. Who has the responsibility? We see this uh, tool as a complement to, uh, uh, to the pathologist. This is not going to be single use. It's going to be uh, what you call um, a first screening tool and then the pathologist will come afterwards. At least the first five years. But who knows in five years where we're going to be? Reimbursement for diagnostics. This is who is paying for what? Uh, and of course, new ethical issues. I mean, let's say, and we just talked about this in the group, let's say that this is a fantastic product. Um, everybody uses it. And in five to 10 years, there will be no prostate pathologist left to actually say. Let's say that we, we can actually, we don't know if this is correct anymore, or perhaps if we're really evil, we can actually manipulate this in any way. So there has to be some checks and balances and everything like this. Otherwise, um, we definitely understand that. But say there are barriers of implementation of diagnostic tools, but still it actually works. And I, it's really fun to be here today. I know if you read Dagens Nyheter here this morning, it uh, was a two-pager from the Prostate Cancer Center at St. Jorans, where I uh, started uh, two years ago, that actually shows that we are using the Stockholm 3 test, MR, and, and actually targeted biopsies and get fantastic results. Um, and I just talked to one of the nurses at the center and they say, we've had like 215 telephone calls so far today. <laughs> um, but I said, it will go over. It will come uh, soon, become normal again. Um, and at the end, I just want to say thank you to the funders. And I think um, going into the developing new diagnostic tools or anything for healthcare, I learned something that... The, there are we need new other uh, funding. I would say special thanks to EIT Health and Vinova, who has been supporting uh, these. I mean, translational from a research project to uh, a product. Uh, that's very very important money. Thank you for listening.